Hi folks, this is Jay. We are visiting an open garden in East Aurora, the lessons from nature by Ling. So we're with the gardener here, Ling. Hi, can we uh, join you on a walk in your garden? Sure, welcome. Please yeah. follow me. Yeah. It's a native plant and a naturalized garden set yeah. up to support nature. Yes. And you can hair. see a wonderful swallowtail uh -huh. butterfly right yeah. on that. Yeah, just before we flower. enter the garden, I want to show very quickly. Oh, okay. So we are visiting the open garden, and this year we have the Artists in Open Garden program. So say a quick hi to our viewer. This is Havana <laughs> Duff. Hi. So she is creating arts live while we have the open garden, uh, uh, getting the inspiration from Ling's garden. Yes, can we uh, enter your garden? Okay. I'll follow you. Do you want to go first? Uh, so I'll follow you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, can you get the swallowtail? Let me try. This yeah. is swamp milkweed uh -huh. that the butterfly, the swallowtail butterfly is on. It's a very important uh, native plant for uh, butterflies and uh -huh. the monarch in particular. Yeah. Next to it is the purple cone flower, another uh -huh. native that's important yeah. for um, yeah. Uh -huh. Butterflies and pollinators. Yeah. So, so tell me what this. Uh... This is a wildflower. It is not native. It was brought over by the settlers. It has uh -huh. herbal qualities. Uh -huh. uh, it's called soapwort. They uh -huh. used to use it to make soap. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is not a native plant, not a but native. it has a purpose in it your garden. It has a definite purpose, and the pollinators do mm. enjoy it. Yeah. So you try to incorporate as much native plant as possible in your garden, but you do not reject other plants just no. because they are not native. As long as it feeds something. Yes. Definitely. Or I like the way it looks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like this. This feeds nothing but it's uh -huh. an annual uh -huh. uh, Rex begonia and uh -huh. it's just a stunning plant. So yeah, there's agree. room for everything. I agree. Anything we can do to encourage people to start garden, that'd be nice. Yeah, we yeah. I yeah, I refuse to join the native plants militant where they are trying to attack people just yeah. for just because they planted a butterfly bush because yep. they say it's from China. I asked them what's wrong with the plants from China. Hosta is from China. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah, we really need to keep an open mind with the plants. Yeah. This is an interesting native called umbrella leaf. Yeah. The leaf is very large. Uh -huh. It gets white flowers in the spring and then these purple berries uh -huh. will darken. They look lovely on the red stems and the yeah. birds love those berries. Yeah. Yeah. I so I see you have a patch of uh, primrose and even after they flower, the leaves have this interesting texture and the yes. shape. They look very nice as a large patch. And the deer don't eat it because oh, it wow. has fuzzy leaves. Yeah. So I see you have some of the very tall perennial uh, yes. in the back of the border. Uh, you have the Joe Pye weed, Joe Pye weed on the left. The, the uh. tall stuff on the right is tall meadow rue. Uh -huh. And then the stuff that looks brown now was beautiful pink last week. That's Philopendula. That's also known a as queen, plant. queen of the prairie. Queen of the prairie. Yes, yep. oh, just magnificent. So uh, this would be a perfect example to see how you should or can use very tall perennial. Uh, use them even to provide a structure in your garden. Mm -hmm. But you want to use them at the back of the border. Definitely. Yes, because <laughs> Definitely. they can get quite, quite tall. Yeah, I'll follow you. Okay. So we we'll enter a more shaded part of your. I mean, would you describe your garden as a woodland garden? Yes, woodland uh -huh. garden. Uh -huh. These are the compost piles. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's nice to be in the shade yeah, on a particularly oh, hot nice and humid day. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Um, some interesting plants here. Yes. This is native Pachysandra. Native Pachysandra. So they don't have this gloss. Glossy right, not leaf. the glossy leaf, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's a very nice plant. Exactly. And so the other thing I noticed at Link's Garden is you have a, quite a collection of different ground cover plants. They just uh, work so well. So people know there are Pakistandra or Vinca, but there are so many interesting options. This is native uh, ginger, ginger, ginger yes. canadiensis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's growing right under this Norway spruce where nothing would grow for yeah, years. So they can take the dry shade can very well. They can take the well. dry shade. Mm -hmm. And I think they probably would benefit by 
you are using them in this kind of a location. If you put them in a very fertile, uh, moist, rich ground, they may be a little hard to contain. Oh, definitely. <laughs> They're hard enough to contain here. That's why I have a plant sale in the <laughs> spring. Yeah. So, Ling, you are a master gardener in Yes, Erie I am a master gardener. Yeah, and you do so much volunteer work, uh, the plant sale and other educational yeah, I do. I do a lot of teaching for the Cooperative Extension. Oh, yeah. We have yeah. fall gardening classes coming up, which uh -huh. they can find out about online. Yeah. And you also have a website. Uh, the I do, Lessons from Nature website. Yeah. And uh, so people can uh, register, sign up for your mail list to mm -hmm. send out newsletter time from time with really good tips on gardening. Thank you. Yeah. And, yep. uh, this is a, a Japanese forest ginger, which has yeah. just a lovely color. Yeah, the pattern is texture. really quite quite unique. Yeah. And just, I see you have another type of ginger over there. Yes, this is called curly ginger. Mm -hmm. Also a very good dense ground cover. The deer yeah. don't eat any of the gingers because they're right. such a pungent flavor. Right. Yeah. And a lot of uh, native ferns mm -hmm. and uh, jack in the pulpits and asters that will be blooming in the fall. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of the good things about natives is you get plants that will bloom all year. Some early season ones, some midsummer, and then of course the asters and goldenrods for the fall. So those, those look like uh, some type of a... Uh, These are hellebore. lenten roars, hellebore. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, are they evergreen? The, they the, are evergreen, So this yep. is the evergreen hellebore. So even after they flower, which they provide such an important uh, early season interest, their leaves uh, stay green and in this such interesting shape. They almost serve like, a, like some kind of a loose ground cover. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, they get quite large. Um, and each variety of hellebore has different leaves. Oh, wow. So that's a different variety. Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. So uh, I want to show the viewer quickly about the viburnum here. So yes. this viburnum is in complete shade. It barely received any... Under a walnut tree. <laughs> under a black walnut tree. So, but you see there are, a, there are abundance of the red berries. So you know it has been flowering very well. So this is a note that many people had the impression that viburnum has to be, they, they need quite a bit of sun. But as you can see here, even in this kind of a shaded area under a black walnut, they can grow pretty well. And they're not particularly laggy or uh, like, one, like one sided. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very beautiful tree. Yeah. It will get a gorgeous fall color if it's in more sun. Yes. Not here. Def yeah. But you still have the berry, which is. I would say more important because... Well, it is for the birds. Yes, absolutely. Yes. A nice patch of bloodroot, which blooms in the spring. Mm -hmm. So now we are exiting the backyard garden and enter uh, the front yard. So, so Ling's garden is at a corner lot in East Aurora. So you're in the village of East Aurora, right? Yes, in the village. In the, in the village of East Aurora. So you wanted to go up here, right? Yeah, I want to show people the, the special raspberry. Okay. Uh. This is called flowering raspberry. It's a native plant, very, very common in our woods. Uh -huh. uh, like shade, it, in the nature it grows on hillsides very often. And uh, the flower... The so the purple flower we're looking at is from the raspberry. Right, uh -huh. and it's uh, preferred by bumblebees oh. and lots of other pollinators. And then it gets a very large black raspberry, which is edible by people, but I leave them for the birds. They're a little bit seedy, and I kind say, of bitter. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. So, so we have a kind of a sunny area. We have some quite interesting. And this is a St. John's wort, a native shrub, which has a very long bloom. And then it gets also dark berries, which yeah. the birds like in yeah. the fall. One thing I for forgot to mention earlier, uh, so, uh, I noticed you have more than a few different plants that has very interesting berry. Yes. And uh, uh, no matter it's a uh, perennial or shrub. So, mm -hmm. well, I, I mean, I rarely see a garden that incorporate plants, provide a color and texture with their berry. In the well, garden. it's very important. You know, unfortunately now so many 
places are stressing uh, plants for pollinators, which is also important. Uh, but the birds need berries. Yes, and, exactly. Um, yeah. So it's very important to grow, yeah, so, so grow for the they birds. They are not only ornamental, pleasing to the eye, they also have a, a purpose in the ecosystem. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So we're working by a, a native uh, hydrangea. Yeah, this is a smooth hydrangea. Is it's it? a lace cap hydrangea. It's a lace cap, okay. There are a couple of uh, native hydrangeas. Uh -huh. Most of the hydrangeas on the market have been hybridized from this native oh, variety. Oh, wow, okay. So, uh, so we can see just, this is another uh, viburnum. So viburnum has this horizontal uh, form. So you really have to give it enough space. If you do any pruning uh, in the hope of reducing the width, it will just destroy the form. It will, look, it will not look good. <laughs> <laughs> it's always best to buy a shrub or a plant mm -hmm. that will fit the space you have yeah. rather than have to Show us the native it. bee balm here. Lane. Okay, this is the native bee balm mm. and complete with lots of bees. And yeah. it's, uh, I had two varieties. I originally had a non-native variety, which some bees did go on it. But once I put the native variety in, it's just covered with bees, and hummingbirds love it too. Oh, hummingbirds too, yeah. yeah. Hummingbirds and they're in this kind of very beautiful lavender shade. Yes. Which it's is a just... somewhat unusual color for Yeah, it's for just nature. lovely. So this will be a more sunny area yes, for your border. Yes, this is sunnier, and this is a nice lavender. This is um, uh, related to the native delphinian. Oh. This is a native larkspur. Uh-huh. I see. And it's quite yeah. lovely. Yeah, so... So you can have quite interesting color uh, by uh, in incorporating native plants in your garden. Absolutely. So it can provide ornamental value to your garden. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So now we are walking towards the other side of the house where we have some quite... Just a second. Yeah. Uh, so we have quite a collection of very interesting container in the garden, which you use them to showcase the mini hostas and some of the annual here. Yes. Yeah. Because they would be lost if you, if you plant them yeah, in no, the ground. They, yeah. they don't do well in the ground. Yeah. So you made those container yourself. Yes, it's called Hypertufa. It's a lightweight concrete mixture. Uh-huh. Yeah, let's show people the mini hosta here. This is just lovely. So, uh, as you can tell, Lin uh, tries to incorporate as much native plants in the garden, but uh, she does this in such a, a aesthetically pleasing way, and she incorporates the container. So, uh, it's not like a wider nest. This is a very well-tended garden. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We have the mini hostas here. With, uh, that is a Rex begonia in the back, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a sucker for Rex begonias. <laughs> and then I just yeah. lift the whole thing up, bring it in for the winter. And so you overwinter them? Overwinter them. So yep. it's, they're not fussy with this overwinter process? No, you have to keep them on the dry side. Oh, on the dry side. Or okay. they get very fungally. Oh, I see. That's a very good tip. And then you also collect rocks I from do. the nature. I want to show the viewer very quickly. So this is a rock you collected. Originally, I saw this look like some type of a fossil, mm -hmm. but you said this is just different mineral mm -hmm. in the rock having resulted this kind of a pattern. But it's just so beautiful. With the, this is another Rex begonia. Yes. Yeah, look at the texture. Yeah, I mean, it's a very simple combination, but uh, it's just stunning. Yeah. It really adds culture to your garden. So now we are returning to a more sunny area. Let's take a long view to show viewer this area. So again, we are at Lessons from Nature. It is an open garden in the village of East Aurora. So uh, the gardener Ling here just took us on for a tour. Yeah, and uh, thank you for sharing your garden with us. Thank you for coming. It's I my hope pleasure. A lot of people come. Thank you.